Hey, everybody. I want to welcome you to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts, and we're doing one of our short episodes today. This is where we do a little bit of a deep dive on a single topic with one of our guests so that we can actually spend a little less time focusing on their life and their history. Our guest today is actually one of our guests on a recent episode, and when Sensei Dofan introduces him, we, we really encourage you to go back and take a look, subscribe, hit the like button, all that kind of thing. Um, so we're really excited to jump into this topic today, which Sensei Dofan is going to introduce. I'm going to introduce to you our hosts today. So I'm really lucky to be here with Hanshi Gary Legacy, who is a 10th degree black belt and founded and runs Legacy Shoryu Karate Jitsu. He's also uh, the head of the Canadian Matsumura Hakatsuru White Crane Association, and he's also a black belt in Iaido. And his Iaido instructor is Sensei Nicholas Suino, who founded the Japanese Martial Arts Center. He's an eighth dan in Iaido, a sixth dan in Judo, a sixth dan in Jiu Jitsu, and he is also the sword instructor. Uh, for my instructor, Sensei Randy Dofan, seventh degree black belt, in legacy shoryu karate jitsu, Matsumura Hakatsuru White Crane, fourth Dan in Iaido, multi time world champ. And uh, it's a pleasure to be the student and friend of these men. Sensei Dofan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Sean. Thanks. Um, I'm really excited to be talking with Guru Skelberg, Johan Skelberg, who, since we did the punch kick choke chat last time, we actually, all of us were together in Ottawa. Trained together, uh, taught together, shared the mats, had allegedly had a couple beverages some some evenings and uh, <laughs> had some good stories. A really, really amazing guy. So I do want to uh, just give some of his accolades. Uh, so he went to the IHM Business School, worked at the Philippine National Police Force. Uh, he studied personal development coaching with Tony Robbins, which I know Sensei Suino is a fan of as well. Uh, uh, his military service was conducted as a, a Navy uh, diver. He started his martial arts journey in 1973 and is currently the instructor and manager at Cali Sikorat HQ Stick Hands and Knives. Uh, he's a European and world champion in stick fighting, a uh, student of Ernesto Priest and founder of uh, Combatan, member of Hanchitarian's World Kabuto Federation, as are all of we. We are all members of the World Kabuto Federation. <clears throat> awesome. And our topic today is taking your martial arts outside of the dojo. And that's why we asked uh, Guru Johan to come on because you could tell from his accolades that he's going to have some, some thoughts on that, Sean. So do your housekeeping, please. I appreciate it, Sensei Dofan. So like I said, we're on all the podcast platforms, we're on the YouTube, and we're so grateful for you to be taking this ride for us. We actually got our stats back for uh, 2022, and it's been awesome. I mean, you've been supporting and growing this show for us, and I, I don't want to push too hard on this, but I want to say how grateful we are. Share it, punch it out there. You know, the, the thing within this martial arts community that we've been able to do, but also we've been able to get back from you is incredible. You know, when you send us those DMs and you and you comment on our stuff and you suggest possible guests, it's awesome to have this interactive show. You know, we want to do this with you, not at you. So thanks for taking the ride with us. Um, and then I just want to jump right into this topic. So I want to start with you, uh, your Scalebird. What do you think out of the gate is the most important thing for our listeners and our viewers to take into account when their, you know, dojo martial arts has to hit rubber meets the road in the real world? <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, th that's many things, but uh, of course it's uh, awareness and everything. Um and and the but I would say the most important thing is uh, whenever you want or have to take action outside of dojo, whatever choices you're gonna make is gonna have a consequence. So it's so easy to say, if this happens, I'm gonna do that, or if that happens, I'm gonna do this. And and uh, everybody have a lot of opinions what to do and what not to do. And uh, but whatever choices we do in in. Um, in struggles or challenges or whatever you want to call it, situations, it's going to have a consequence. So a lot of people say, I never want to hurt somebody, but if it might not go that way, you might have other consequences and so on. I might do whatever to defend this or that, and that's also probably going to have a consequence. And to understand that, I think that's one of the most important things, because that kind of sets the guidelines what you're ready to do and what you're not ready to do in a situation. And I obviously want to go around the horn. I think this is a really important question, but do you do you think you can ever be truly prepared for what could happen out there? 
can't, re I can't really give a short answer on that, but being aware and um, be proactive, you can uh, stop a lot of things from actually happening from the, in the first place. And like uh, the police is saying, there's a lot of statistics, I'm sure it's the same all around the world, but uh, 80, 90 percent of all the troubles are around people who drink alcohol or other drugs. So, yeah, if you stay away from all of that, you're going to minimize the risk quite a lot, but it's not from everything. But there's so many things you can do proactively to avoid a lot of trouble. That's staggering. I mean, that's a huge statistic. Like you can go down to 10 percent at worst if you eliminate booze and drugs. Yeah, um, that's a really important thing, I think, to point out. Um, let's the, go other nine, the other nine percent is driving a car. Yeah, right. Road rage. Road rage. Road rage. The yeah, other nine percent is that drugs, alcohol, and cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hanchi Legacy, what do you think? What's the most important thing for someone listening to take into account going from the dojo and something happens on the way home? What, what should they know? I think, uh, I think we're moved ahead of something. Like, uh, what kind of a student are you? Did you choose the right school? Like, you're, you're talking like everyone is trained properly, like they're you're going out in the street. You have you need to choose a good school that fighting is a, a regular thing, weekly, daily. You have to build your confidence in um, your regular training, right? Uh, do a lot of bag work, hit the bag a lot of times. Make sure you develop a good knockout punch. Um, You have to get used to be standing, like say you're young, a young lady or a small person like myself. You have to get used to standing in front of somebody who's trying to hit you at the dojo, but out in the street, they're trying to knock you out. So I think a lot of your training is important. And in situation self-defense, you know, where they teach you self-defenses. Say somebody grabs you by the wrist, you do a self-defense and get out of it. You're still going to have to fight that person. So uh, choose your school wisely. Make sure that when you go in there to uh, join a karate club, if you just want to do it for health, fine, because you will get in good shape and you'll develop a good mental attitude. But if you're talking about confronting somebody in the street, which is completely different, you know, protecting the life of someone you love, <coughs> your own life, then it all starts with the dojo that you choose. Mm. They just do kata, which there's nothing wrong with that. But we're talking street level. I would suggest you may even look for Okinawan karate clubs because that's where it was invented on the street in Okinawa. Thanks, Hanchi. And one of the things I just want to chip in real quick that you said about the knockout power. Uh, one of our guests, Leo Laux, once said that if you hit someone with your best technique and it doesn't work, you're in trouble. So you know, make sure that's owned before you have to. to. Yeah, he learned how to hit in our school. Exactly. Um, Sensei Suino, what do you think? Most important thing for people to think about. Man, I love that answer. I wasn't expecting. Uh, uh, I wasn't expecting to 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 think about that. But Hanchi Legacy made a great point. You know, prepare everything. Listen. Awareness is so critical. You've got to know where to go and where not to go. You've got to know what to look for to avoid, right? Avoidance is the best form of self-defense. But once you're in it, Hanchi's absolutely right. You've got to be able to execute. And um, it's why I'm such a big fan of pressure testing, whatever you do, right? Kata is wonderful. Um, uh, drilling single techniques is wonderful. But, uh, you know, if you grapple, I want to spend some of my time grappling with people that are really trying to are really trying to pin me or t or submit me. Um, if I'm if I'm striking, I want to put on the gloves and the mouth guards um, and be face the consequence of of hard strikes uh, because because so many people and we've talked about that on this show before. So many people, you know, who've never gotten hit or never gotten never gotten choked or or uh, maybe they get a broken bone, a broken finger. So many people will wilt and completely collapse at that. But if there's somebody trying to kill you that can't be the end for you, right? You have to be able to move through that. So I'm just a huge fan of pressure testing as part of the whole self-defense arsenal. That's awesome. Thanks, Sensei. Suno Sensei Do fan? Well, I like the stuff about awareness, but it won't surprise anybody on this call. I like to be able to choose if I want to, maybe I want to go over there. 
maybe I'm aware and I want to engage in something. So I want to be aware because I want to go engage in it. Or maybe I'm aware and I want to cross the street and not engage in it. Um, we're all people who can make the choice to engage or not engage. Uh, we're lucky in that way. Um, one of the things I would tell people is when you leave the dojo, let go of the fantasy that you've created in your mind at, in the martial arts school, right? Oh, I beat 10 people in the dojo today. That doesn't matter. Some hobo might like slam you onto the ground and kick the shit out of you if you think he's going to fight you the same way that somebody who's fighting you in here and let go of all that ego stuff as you leave the dojo. Nobody cares that you're a seventh degree black belt or a 10th degree black belt. If they're willing to engage with you, they're not going to give a shit about any of that stuff. You were a world champion. You were a 10th Dan. You were, a, you were that. You better just have trained hard enough to be able to let that go and just survive it. And, you know, Sean, I've said it to you before, right? Uh, don't live in the fantasy world. If you get home alive out of a scrape, your martial arts served you well. Like if you, if you get home at the end of the day, you got in a scrape and you get home, you didn't go to the hospital, you didn't get any like major injuries, your martial arts saved you well. Or, or maybe even if you did get some major injuries, maybe your martial arts still served you well, depending right. on the situation you find yourself. So I guess I would say let go of the fantasy of the dojo when you leave. Uh, the dojo that's one of the things you can do for yourself right on um one thing i want to throw out and then partly i want to use my answer to throw it back to see what you think of what i say uh guru scaleberg because there's a bit of a provocative thought in there but for me about the avoidance idea you know i once was wrestling with a guy and i thought we were playing and he thought we were fighting and i got my arm broken and i learned a big lesson that day and so what i tell my students is you have to be willing to kill or die if you're going to fight because you don't know who's got a handgun behind them. You don't know who's got a knife waiting and feels threatened by what you thought was going to be a punch or two. And so it could just be a punch or two, but it could be life or death over a traffic incident. And I guess that's my question for you, Guru Scaleberg. Do you think that's right? That if you engage somebody, you do have to be willing to kill or die in case it escalates that heavy? I, I do. I do. Um, that's one of my early lessons with my Japanese master. Um, uh, she had no soccer Jimmy he he when he was teaching uh, Japanese philosophy he was uh, we're not here to learn a technique or, or uh, uh, do this or that we're here to learn to kill and uh, that was very provocative already then and I was uh, 15 years old and uh, thinking a lot about it and the more I learn about situations or things that happen to people it's we we think we are in the illusion that I have this technique and I want to go all this way, but I want to stop here. But that's not our choice because we don't know if we are meeting common sense or logic or whatever. Somebody goes on substances or whatever. If uh, somebody get the weird idea that we want to kill them, so they think they have to kill us, we cannot stop until we're <clears throat> done with the deed. If that's killing or uh, choking out or submitting, I, I, I don't know, but it's normally not our choice. And that's uh, an illusion when we think that we con can control the situation entirely. We have to uh, walk the line, sort of. And um, it's not always so that we can choose how far that will be. In the ring, you have a referee. They stop you. And uh, But outside the ring, there's no referee. So we have no idea how far we need to go. And again, you can do a soccer punch on somebody and they fall badly and they die. We don't know. So whenever we do something, those things can happen. Coming back to, again, whatever you do, going to have some kind of consequence. Uh, but it won't, we not always be the way we want it to be. So when we stand up for ourselves, we need to go all the line, uh, depending on what the other person uh, intend to do. Thanks for that. We're going to go around the horn and end on Sensei Dolphin, who will flip us into a new question. Um, Hanchi, got to be willing to kill or die if you trade blows with a guy at Tim Hortons? Well, <clears throat> let's say you're confronted by um, more than one person. One person is is bad enough, but when you're confronted by more than one person, uh, that happened to be one time, you can't just throw some sort of punch or technique to stop that person because he's going to get up twice as peeved off at you as he was in the first place. And then you have to turn to face another person and then another and another. Um, 
I was confronted by four people one time. That means that you have to have that punch that when you hit that person, that they're gonna drop. Uh, I, I, this, isn't, this is all the bad talk you try to keep out of the dojo. I've been in several situations. None of them started by me. All of them finished by myself. Uh, because in a way you, you have to remain very calm. But then I found that on the way home, I, my nerves got a little bit shaky after the confrontation, just that I was so calm at the time. So um, um, some of the things, a couple of things I wanna tell you, if you're facing more than one person, get your back to something. Don't just stand there, get your back to a wall, a garbage can, a fence. And that way you keep everybody in front of you as well. So I, I don't wanna take up too much time. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Anchi Sensei Suino, kill or die, or is that extreme? Uh, I, I don't know, man, my view is, has changed on it. Um, I, I've told the story, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in a, up in a neighborhood where there was a lot of, a lot of um, kind of racial strife and it wasn't unusual for one group of people to beat up another. And sometimes it was throw a few punches, steal their lunch and they ran. Right. But, you know, on a weekly basis, somebody that I knew would get ganged up on by other people and five, six, seven or eight people, you know, they'd punch them a few times and they kick them when, the, you know, when they're on the ground, you know, as a kid, you can go, Oh, you know, we're tough. We can all do that. But th the fact is, that was really dangerous and people could have been killed. There were certainly bones broken and concussions, right? Um, um, at the time, you know, it was fight or run. Uh, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would have fought a lot harder than I did in those days because I understand the consequences better. So um, yeah, you just don't know, man. I mean, it's, uh, even a casual punch could be deadly under the right circumstances. So I think you have to really be able to sort it out in your brain and then act accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Before I punched into Sensei Dolphin, like I was in one situation recently where a guy was like wanting to fight. I was like, how far do you want to take this? He goes, as far as you want. And right next to me was a Marine hunting knife, like behind my door. And I just, I looked at him. I said, I'm going to drive away. You're going to cheer at me, but it's your lucky day. And you're not going to believe me. And as I drove away, he's like, fuck you all this and that. But lest my ego get too big, he could have had something behind him. You know, like Hanshi, you always used to say, you never know who you're standing opposite. So uh, I was happy to drive away thinking I got the better. The guy, he probably thought he got the better me and we'll never know what the real answer was. Sensei Dovan? Listen, if I'm understanding the, the question right, the question is, would you? Like, how far would you take it? No, I think the question's more, if you engage, are you automatically entering a place where you have to be willing to do either? Okay, so then I think it depends on the situation, but I, I definitely think... Yeah, it shouldn't surprise people as martial artists that we're highly skilled. And if you engage with, with one of us, then it's not our choice, as, as Guru Skelberg said. Like, you're pulling it out of us, and then you're pulling it out of the wrong person. Like, you should go, you should go find a different person, because just even to your last point, you don't know. You, right? you think you know, you don't know. Um, but it shouldn't surprise people that that's our attitude. We're martial artists. Everybody on this call is a military artist. We're just not in service to our country. We're in service to the arts. But those arts go back tens of thousands of years. And they involve killing and death and battle. Like that's where they come from. Karate philosophy, Okinawan karate philosophy. One strike, one kill. That's not, that doesn't come from nowhere. That comes from somewhere, right? So yeah. And if the question was, would I, I would. And I think everybody on this call would as well, um, if it was called out of us. But but again, it, this is not easy because it's so easy to say, yeah, I would do this, I would do that. Uh, but it's moral, moral ethics. And then we have a law. Uh, I, I brought <laughs> down a guy once. He had uh, done some bad things and I brought him down really hard. But at the same time, I started to think maybe this is too hard. Maybe somebody are going to press charges against me. So I was a little bit hesitant to that because it, the, the situation, as I knew, I, I, I got a lot more information afterwards, but it, everything happened so quick. So I took him down very harsh and uh, started to think, oh, maybe I'm in trouble now. So again, there's always that consequence. We don't really know. 
Yeah. I've never been in those types of situations. Mine have always been like street scrapes, right? Like not, not as a law enforcement officer, such as yourself or a military officer. Um, yeah. But my upbringing, I think personally for me, my upbringing, you know, I, I went and visited uh, very close family members in prison who had shot other people with firearms. And that just, to me, when I was young, that just seemed like a normal, like it wasn't out of the norm for me to be thinking that way. And I think the dojo actually helped me with that a lot. But I, I want to go to now to, Sean, did you have any comments on that before? No, I wanted to throw that your way now for one of your questions. Yeah, so I guess one of the questions that I have for everybody on this call is, um, how important do you think it is uh, to contemplate your responses beforehand? And of course you can't contemplate every response, but I mean situationally. So, um, you know, why would somebody attack me? A 51 year old, uh, fairly in good shape man, getting off his motorcycle with tattoos on it. Why would somebody attack me? And then what are the reasons why you would respond, each one of you, why, why would you respond with uh, dangerous, let's call it dangerous force, bordering on lethal force? Do you think about that? Should people think about it? Um, and uh, Johan, we'll go to you last this time, so you can have some time to hear the answers and, and contradict any of us. And Sean, we'll start with you first. Okay, great. Um, I think people should think about this often. I think about it all the time. I, I'll be at a party of friends, and I'll just unconsciously be picking up where my elbows are in relation to theirs in terms of a back take or what, like, it's just, it's a game in that sense for me because I love body dynamics in relation to other bodies. That's so much of what we're doing. Um, as far as though the, the level of like, what would a response to A, B or C be? I do think it's really important and not to put this into like athletics, but we did talk about it with our guest from the Jamaican bobsled team that, <clears throat> Visualizing something before we do it is proven to increase our ability to respond even out of the gate. I think that's the most important part, right? Because if I'm caught unawares, then, you know, a white belt will do just fine. But if I'm not caught unawares, then it's probably not their day. And that for me is about, oh, this is happening. And if I've never thought about it, I'll be processing in real time, uncertain what's going on. Whereas if I've thought about it, even in relation to friends and body dynamics, then I'm a little more ready. Um, as far as when I would, look, I have been, I talk about how I haven't really street fought. I have been in confrontations in the street, I'm going to say 50 times. They just have never led to anyone throwing a punch. And I really take that as I never clocked that it was go time through an actual imminent danger. And I have to trust, even though I haven't lived in that situation, that I would know the difference between, yeah, this is going to fizzle and they're going to walk away and I'm going to walk away. Or the thing I haven't felt yet, which is go. So my answer is I'll go whenever I feel go. Thank you. Ted Sestrino, what are you thinking about all this? Can you reframe the question for me? Yeah, it's just how much should you pre pro how much thought should you give to when you're going to respond. And, you know, for me personally, I'll just tell you, like, my thought on response is usually like high level response. Not I'm not talking about like, well, I'll push them down and run them away. Like, I'm talking about when are you going to use lethal deadly force? And should you be thinking about that? Yeah, and yeah. You, yeah, visualization is so important. I think we need, I think the beauty of martial arts training done right is that you visualize yourself acting and winning in a lot of situations, a lot of times. So you're programming yourself for that flow. But, uh, you know, that whole thing about awareness, you know, I think you should walk into a restaurant, find the most strategic seat. When you sit down, look around to see who's sticking out as a possible danger, you know, keep your senses about you. Um, it's a kind of a game, but it's not a game. Um uh, yeah, I, I you prepare yourself at all times, man. Imagine if you walked around preparing yourself to lose all the time and deliberately averted your eyes from danger. Maybe you get your whole life, maybe you make it through your whole life without ever having to use self defense, but it just doesn't seem like a very productive way to live. Yeah, since you seem to remember the last time I we went out to dinner, you, me, Pam, and Erica, I asked your daughter, I want you to look around this room and tell me who the biggest threat in this room is 
or what the biggest threat in this room is. None of us looked at the sauce on the chicken, but she did pick out a couple of people that she should be paying attention to. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't say you and me. <laughs> <laughs> like I see you, you're the one who taught me that lesson. So I um, yeah, I'd be I, interested to hear what you have to say about it. Uh, I, always, I always tell my students that, that as a game, just like Sensu Suino said, but it's not a game. Just for fun, I say, Whenever I go to a um, variety store, a variety store, I open the door and the first thing I do is scan the place. You don't want to walk yourself in a robbery or something. Probably one time of 10,000 it'll ever happen, but it still keeps you mentally sharp. You know, so uh, you never know why people attack you, but people have different um, mental problems sometimes. Um, we just have to react to the situation. That's why we've trained 50 years. That's why we've trained. And that's why we're all high ranking black belts because we've either ran into those situations or we're mentally prepared at all times. And, you know, it doesn't mean that a black belt can't be standing there and then some guy out of a, a friendly crowd comes over and punches you in the side of the head. You can't be hit or you can't be taken down by somebody. But what happens after? Like nobody's with a small G, nobody's got, right? Nobody can see the what is gonna happen in the future. So I find that. Uh, I In my dojo, I teach as Randy and my students will be able to tell you is, I don't only have you fight when you're in the black belt grading or when you're on the floor, you don't just face one person. I, after you fight maybe five to 10 persons, then I put you up against two people. And then sometimes I put five people in and say, nobody's on your side, everybody fight. Just like a gang fight, it's happening. And you can go from anyone to anyone else. It's like a complicated fight, right? So. Uh, we prepare our black belts very well. And I'm sort of proud of that. Because, and then the other thing is that if my students get into any serious confrontations, they have to come back and tell me. I don't want to hear it from someone else. Thanks, Hatsu. So, uh, Guru Skelberg, before we go to you, I just want to say one of the things I, and it's changed over the years, but I, I always would tell myself, certain things like if you touch one of my kids i'm going to respond like if you if you come after one of my kids i'm going to respond if i'm teaching this class and somebody walks in this door and challenges it's not going to be the other people i'm going to respond to that uh if you're coming in my window in the middle of the night uh, uh and you're not expected to be coming through that window i'm going to respond and the force that i'm going to respond with is going to be extreme so and then some things like I used to always say, if somebody puts their hand on me, then I'm going to respond to that, like, you know, in an aggressive way. Now I don't like after years and years, I'm like, okay, well, there's more nuance to that. The other ones for me still don't come in my window at two o'clock in the morning. You're not going to be met with a good response. If you do might not even be a physical response, might not be a karate response, could be some other response, allegedly. So anyway, how do you take all this? Uh, uh, Guru Skelberg, you're listening to all these things. You have a lot of experience with this. You've traveled the world. You've been in a lot of different places. How do you take this? Uh, there's a lot of things in, in one here. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to stick a little bit to the point. But uh, uh, first, I, I want to address, just like we've been spoke about earlier here, that uh, it's so important to have that knockout capability. And there's only one way to practice that. It's not only the pads. You need to spar once in a while to, to feel if you have that capability to, to knock somebody out one way or another with an ob object or, or with your punch or whatever. But again, this is not sports, so it's uh, weight differences for sure. But the only, it's only one way to find out. And that's to practice close to that edge and actually do it sometimes. You can't do that every class for sure. But when you spar, those things happen. And uh, also talked about uh, 
practice to submission, whatever that's punching somebody into pump, uh, submission or somebody's launching at you and you have to choose if you submit or not. Because when we start to touch that um, line or that now we start to see how you actually start to react to those things. And they, it's so easy, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. But I like the saying, the fight doesn't start when you start to throw in punches. The fight starts when you actually don't want to fight any longer, but have to do it anyway. Mm. Because in practice, you can always say, okay, I need a break or bow or stop. But if you actually agree that, okay, now we're going to spar until somebody gives up. And uh, a lot of things happen uh, mentally there. Because if you want to give up in the dojo, that might be a little bit damaging for your ego, but you can deal with that. But if you're doing it against somebody who have no idea how far they want to go, it's going to be a totally different mind um, game there, how to think uh, regarding that. And the only way to learn how you respond or how you act is to get more experienced and be closer to that sensation and practice in that field, which is not very comfortable. And the better you want to be in this, the more uncomfortable situations you want to get into to be a little bit used to it it will not be like you're used to everything but being used to be uncomfortable going to help you deal with the stress and the craziness this is not for everybody that's for sure mm -hmm. but uh, if you want to understand this you want to go there and wherever you are in your martial arts sparring wise whatever is always that next level uh so so that's one of the things Regarding to response, I'll have a couple of stories. I'm not sure if I told them in the earlier episodes or not, but uh, back in the days, me and a friend had a company at the airport. It was a valley parking company, and we had the safety parking, and we had some breakings there, which was... Uh, yeah, it was the ruin of our company because we had safety parking and we had the break-in. So uh, we were um, sleeping there at night, and I remember that uh, all of the parking area um the alarm went off like 3 34 o'clock in the morning i was sleeping with my clothes on and i had a big bahi stick which is almost like an iron bar <laughs> and i ran out of the entire parking with that iron bar in my hand and my pulse was probably 208 or something but the ad <laughs> adrenaline was all over the place and i ran all over probably in the uh, olympic uh, speed or something like that but i just realized i was so happy that i didn't confronted anybody because it was a false alarm because if there had been somebody there i'd probably kill them with that stick right. i'd probably smash their head in and afterwards i started to think probably wouldn't have been worth it because even though they did a break in wouldn't justify me killing them but i was so pumped up with adrenaline and also fear of course uh, so i would probably smash them to death if somebody been there because i was alone i didn't know so that, that was one thing that makes me think a lot about, oh, was that worth the consequence if I've done that? No, it wasn't. So it made me think. A couple of years later, I lived in the same neighborhood as my partner uh, on that company. And he had a break in um, in his house. So they were stealing everything of value in the bottom floor while uh, him and his wife was sleeping upstairs. Uh, we lived just a few houses down the same street, and uh, we had four boys sleeping in, uh, in our home back, back then. Now I start to think, if somebody's entering our house in the middle of the night, I'll take the same stick and I'll smash their head in. Because if somebody's there, I don't know if they are one or, or, or drugs or if they're armed. So if I wake up in the middle of the night, somebody's in the house who shouldn't be that, I'll clean the house. But now it was a conscious choice. And I, I also realized I can take that consequence because I cannot take the consequence of not taking action. But mm -hmm. that would probably be the same outcome like the previous story there. But now it was a conscious choice. I need to protect my family. I don't know what I'm dealing with in the middle of the night. I, I just have to do that. Luckily, it didn't happen, though. But now it was a conscious choice. I, I can deal with that. I love that. I love that, uh, Guru Skilberg. I can't take the consequence of not acting. That's, that's a really powerful statement, right? That's, you know, it's the whole yin yang symbol, right? On one side, you're like, I can't take the consequence of acting. Somebody's stealing a car. It's not worth dying. But then on the other side of it, I can't take the consequence of somebody harming my family, my children, or my partner. That's, that's awesome. Uh, 
Uh, did you want to say something? I did. Uh, um, just for everyone um, in Canada, I have a lot of police officers that are on my students. Never pick up a weapon. If somebody's attacking, if somebody's in your house, maybe attacking you, even at that time, if you, he told me, or she told me, I just don't want to say who it is, uh, that if somebody's in your house or if you're being attacked and they pick up a weapon, you can literally get away with murder. If, because they have a weapon and if you hit them so hard because you don't want to, you don't want to be banged up by the weapon because the weapon, can kill you. Like you may not intend, but if you have some type of weapon, a knife, an iron bar, whatever, um, you can get yourself into a lot. So um, I'm advising most people of, to learn empty handed karate. If you, um, if you're, uh, you're, you're a stick student, you know, when you do the different uh, self defenses, if someone's in your house threatening the life of your kids, like uh, Sensei says, uh, and you don't have a self-defense, then um, I would suggest that you do it. Try to avoid using a weapon. And that's just, uh, we all know that if you had to, you'd pick one up. If a guy came in with a three foot razor, you'd have to pick something up to defend yourself. It's that simple. But, Usually, if they don't have a weapon and you pick one up, you will be in big trouble. Thanks, that's it. Says the Suno, I know you had some thoughts and some things you wanted to chime in on with everybody. So where do you want to take this? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a shift, but I want to pose a, a maybe a challenging specific tactical question. Uh, uh, Girl Skalberg, um, here's a scenario for you. Uh, you're you're walking down the street with your with somebody important to you next to you a good friend wife child and somebody walks up to you and <clears throat> makes a, a threat that is very obviously going to be physical what are the first moves you make what are you looking for how do you hold your body what steps do you do are there distancing that you're are you thinking about distancing like what are a few things you'd think about in a situation like that uh, distancing is the first thing for sure and if i'm walking with somebody important i'll uh, i'll try to put myself in between to line them up so they're behind me if possible of course tell them to stay if there's one person you try uh, you, you want to have them as far as possible if there's multiple opponents it's a little bit different game because you want to line them up but mm. the distancing is the first thing because that's uh, that's the only thing that gives you more time to react. If you don't have that distance, you will not have enough reaction time. Uh, but of course, I'm also going to go verbally, try to calm down the situation as much as possible, for sure. Uh, I want to be in balance. I want to keep my hands up without looking aggressive. So I don't want to stand there. I don't want to fight, cool down. I, I would like to have like a, a low key body body language for sure, but still keep my hands up mm. to, to be ready there. And the, then you need to read the person. There are all, all those uh, signs um, like the, the stare, uh, grooming, um, all those things. And uh, normally before you throw a punch, you need to do some kind of... Um, body shift <clears throat> so you need to load up a little bit so you have to look on how they are standing if they can throw a punch or not so uh, <clears throat> you, you want to read the person as much as possible <clears throat> to, uh, be, to be ready for uh, for the action so to say but again if they say they're going to do bad things that would be my trigger to begin okay so all of that has gone well. You've created distancing. You protected somebody behind you. You positioned yourself. You're in balance. That person takes a swing at you, but because of your distancing, they miss. What's your first? What's your first counterattack? That again depend on if somebody is uh, drunk, <coughs> and uh, if I feel they are a little bit. Uh, now it's, it's not a scale to this, but if they are drunk. And uh, I don't feel they are really a big threat. I would just push them away. Uh, I've done that a lot of times before going into uh, fists and stuff. But again, if I feel that it's a, a serious threat, I would try to uh, throw a, as hard a, a, of a punch as possible. And I prefer a cross or a hammer fist. That's my first choice. Love it. Love it. A little bit longer. 
I, that would be a straight kick. Mm. 100%. Well, they, they better leave some space because you can reach out and touch someone. Um, uh, okay, one more question. I've heard a lot of people say that as long as somebody is chirping, you're pretty safe. You have to worry when they stop chirping. Right? What do you think yeah. of that? I, I don't know. I, I don't have that much experience of that particular thing. But nor mm -hmm. normally, people are talking. Yes, uh, they normally shut up uh, before swinging because it's not that easy to do at the same time, though. But uh, there are a couple of signals, uh, like when people start to, to do stuff with a face, so getting their hands ready, or they try to distract you with something, maybe point with one thing and receive uh, the shoulders and the hips is charging up. Could be finger signals as well, um, mm -hmm. but again, if is it the puncher? Is it the grappler? Grappler normally curves down a little bit and get ready to launch. So, so signals could be different there. Is that what you meant by the term grooming? You said grooming earlier. Yeah, th that that word has uh, different meanings there. But if people start to do stuff, get ready to move and. Uh, that could be a signal that the stuff is uh, on the way to happen. Mm. 100%. So, you know, on that note, uh, I once did a seminar with uh, uh, Renchi Angato Kasama, who is a high-level karate person, but he's also a, was a Baltimore State uh, police officer. Um, I don't want to say, like, he's he's taking Taking it to the most extreme you could take it to. And he taught us about something called the tension, tension reduction cycle. Mm -hmm. And where it's like with a high percentage, like in the 99 percentile, they're going to attack you. And when they're talking, they're not going to. And there's this cycle of talking, then what, what uh, Guru Skelberg was talking about. They're talking, then they're not, then they're moving. Then they start talking again. And then they're they're grooming, they're moving, and then they're talking again. And then when they stop talking, they're going to come after you. Like they've prepared themselves. The talking and not talking is them psyching themselves up to make the move that inevitably they want to make. And he teaches that to the FBI. Like that's taught to FBI in the United States. So there must be some science behind it. I actually wouldn't mind chipping in on that back to you, Guru Skelberg, because you did say something like if they start telling you what they're going to do to you, that's when I act. But, you know, I've had people be like, I'm going to kill you, you mother and, and they aren't. So at what point do you take it as real and go, oh, that's a real verbal threat. I'm going to act before they start. Or at what point do you do the kind of thing we're talking about or sense of offense uh, elucidating? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a matter of if you believe them or not. Right. Uh, again, <laughs> it, 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 is it the talker stuff? But if uh, I, I wouldn't say I've done it uh, many, many times, but I've done it quite sometimes. Uh, when people get too close and start to be very aggressive, I normally don't start punching if I don't feel that they are actually uh, re fighting already. But I, I normally like to put a, a big hand straight to the face and just push them away really really hard and, and that's if a coming hand. back and and that's if, big if hand. they're coming back i'm ready yeah i like it because now now i'm not that aggressive uh, but if they're too close and i just push them away but really hard and i i, I make a statement okay if you want to go i already done some stuff if you come back i'm ready for more um so i, that, I haven't that's thought about that very good for me yeah, so for you, um, Guru Skilberg, you can do that. And so could Sense of Legacy, and so could Sense of Suino, and so could Sense of Benson. Because I have this theory that as a black belt, you've given yourself more time if you've trained in the right place. Like if you've been training for a long time, then you've given yourself more time to go past the moment when everybody else would have had to react. Like somebody who never trained before couldn't get past the critical distance or they're in grave danger. Like they're not going to be able to do that, that straight hand to the face and be ready. Like you're talking about that's mm. because of your, your training. And so in my mind, I'm always like, no, there's this critical distance. There's these bubbles. And if you like, if we're talking and you're outside the bubble, you're fairly safe. We're going to be okay. But if you start to cross, you start to cross that bubble, then there's going to be some, 
to your words, there's going to be some consequences for me and you once we get into that critical distance. Said so Stacey, what are you thinking about this stuff? You haven't said anything too much about it. Well, a lot of people covered some of the things I was thinking, but I'm um, just going to go to extremes. Uh, some guy is standing in front of you and threatens he's going to kill you. You're going to stand there and wait till he starts to move, and then you're you're trained to move. As you'll be looking for his movement, either in his hip or in his knees. But um, if a guy is standing there with a gun, he says, I'm going to kill you. You don't have to wait for anything. It's like uh, Sensi said, um, your, the fight has already started. And I, I believe through good, fine training that, again, like what you said, was you know when a person is going to start or, or you just look for the slightest body movement and you close in. If you close in on them, they're not expecting that. If you back away and walk around, they're still fielding you sort of. But when you step inside of their critical distance, they are then on the defensive side. They don't know what's gonna happen and you've taken over. So uh, again, it depends on the situation, but always err on the safe side. Love that. Says Suno, is there somewhere else you wanted to take that before? I do have a question, but if you want, want to follow up or let me share one more thought and then I'll turn it, I'll kick it back to you. So what Hanshi just said is really interesting to me. Um, that whole concept of initiative, who's got the drive, who's got the offense, and who's got the defense, right? When the bad guy comes at you, he thinks he has the initiative, right? He's moving forward. A lot of times you move in, as Hanshi said, you take over the the offensive or initiative position. And what I've found uh, uh, is that the crazier people are, the more they're sensitive to that stuff, right? Crazy people are really sensitive to emotions and distance. And when someone's going off and you move in, often that's enough, enough to change the dynamic a lot, mm -hmm. just changing the distance. The more the situation escalates, the less you have, right? The less distance it takes and the less time you have. But early on in those interactions, you can make a huge difference with body language, with distancing, with verbal stuff. Uh, that's a powerful tool right there. Yeah. That's got, a great right? That was what I wanted to actually go into. I wanted to go into some specifics on that, which was presence, right? Your presence mm -hmm. as a martial artist um, and things. I want to go around the horn with everybody. Give it some thought about a specific situation where your presence just squashed something because somebody recognized something. So I'll start it off and I'll tell you that about two summers ago, I had this kid. I say he's a kid. He was probably like 24, 25. And <laughs> again, it was a road rage situation. He got super irritated and like put his truck in between my car and wouldn't let me move. And I got out of the car and he jumped out and we started, he started talking a lot and I didn't talk too much. He just said, well, come over here. And so I came over there and then, you know, he started saying a bunch of stuff. And I said, I eventually just looked at him and said, I could just almost see him like sizing me up and then deciding this is a really bad idea. Like I could see this going on in his head. And I just looked at him and said, listen, young man, you and I both know nothing's going to happen here. You should just get in your truck and drive away. And he just turned around and got his truck and drove away. Right? So, so I, I just, I wonder, I want to go around the horn. Have any, I know Benson, you have, because we've talked about it, but any specific stories like that, Ben's, where your martial arts presence is just, they didn't I mean, know you were a martial artist, but they just realized this is not the right thing for me to do here. You know, I've shared the one where the biker was coming at me like this and I just stood so stock still and going back to the idea of danger. I never felt like he was going to swing. I don't know why to this day, but I just stood so relaxed and I was like, this won't be good if I start it, but if he starts it, I'll play. And, but I was just stock still and he got so confused. He wasn't getting the reaction he was baiting, but nor was he getting fear and he didn't know what to do. And I literally watched him go, and walked away like it actually made his body quiver with a sort of short circuit and i've told you that my buddy as we walked out of the bar went that's awesome i've never seen you do your karate before and i really went thanks for noticing brother and just a little quick one a guy was chirping an outfit i was wearing 
you know, I was wearing like a rocker outfit down in LA and he just kept insulting me. And I, I wasn't even being threatening. I was like, dude, why do you, why are you picking on me right now? I said it like, just like that. And he started to get up. And as he was leaning forward, I said, don't get up. And he just looked at me and went, okay. And I said, I'm going to go to the bar and we'll both have a good night. And he goes, okay. So that was one where I literally like, as if he had risen, something in me said, go. And so I said, don't get up. And he heard me and it was kind of cool. I was like, oh, that was fun. Oh, I guess it's as simple as it gets for me, like the inaction, but the preparedness. Perfect. I'm going to go to Sense Legacy, then Sense Sestrino, and then we're going to go back to Guru Skelberg. Sense Legacy, like I know a lot of the stories, like I could tell them <laughs> for you. So and I don't know. I'm not leading you. You could talk to the one about the guy with the ice fishing rod and the snow scraper. Oh, that story. You, I got to wanted- hear that story again. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to, but... But you you should tell a story because I know you've been in situations where people just made the mistake and then stopped, right? Well, we'll go with that one. I was just uh, stopped on the street in London and this person in front of us wanted to turn. This guy was excited about wanting to um, to get by. He must have been in a hurry. So we, he was blowing the horn. He was doing everything. So I also was turning in. And I got out of the car. I was with Bill Hale. <coughs> and um, the guy starts yelling, gets out of his car across the street. And he opens his back door and he's throwing stuff in the back seat and everything. And he jumps out and he's standing there with uh, a window cleaner and a fishing rod. <laughs> he comes running across the street at me. I'm just standing there watching him do all this. Like right away, I had decided guy is not going to attack me so he he just came over within reach and he goes all right let's go i reached out and grabbed his fishing pole and took it out of his hand and said hey give me my fishing pole back i gave it back to him <laughs> and then he he sort of just calmed down and walked away <laughs> that wasn't um, oh my god that's what he wanted me to tell you i guess yeah, That's a great story. I think it's funny because uh, he thought he was going to intimidate you, and he didn't. And then <laughs> when you grabbed the fishing pole, and he said, give it back to me. I mean, talk about having your balls removed right there in front of everybody. Right? Like, anyway, said to Strino, I don't know if you're going to be able to top that, but have you no. had situations where your uh, presence just stopped things from happening? Yeah, surprisingly, a lot of them. Um The most recent one was probably, gosh, five or seven years ago. Um, You know, my wife and I used to manage an apartment complex and there was a guy there that turned out he was schizophrenic. And so he would have these episodes and he would just say really frightening things to people in the, in the complex. So I had to kick him out. Right. So I got the paperwork all ready and I saw him walking through the courtyard one day and I walked up to him and I handed to him, he goes, what's this? And I said, Oh, that's a, an eviction notice. And he looks at me and he's like, fuck you, man. And he starts walking up to me. And it was what I was saying earlier about craziness, right? He walks up to me and he gets about this close. So I walk up to him and he backs up. Mm. And then I walk up to him and he backs up. And the whole time he's jawing, right? Back, 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 back. And he backs up and he backs up and he backs up. And he walks backwards up the stairs. And I walk and he gets his keys out and he opens the door and he goes in the room. You know, he goes in his in his hallway and he's backing up. And I just let the door close, right? But he's jawing the whole time. It's just so funny. It was like a movie, right? He comes to me and I come to him and him and him and him. And then, you know, three days later, he's gone. Probably motherfucking me the whole time. That's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got Guru Skelberg laughing now, so it doesn't have to be funny, uh, 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 Guru Skelberg, but has your your presence, if people don't know, uh, Johan is a tall person, he's in good physical condition, um, <laughs> I would think he would have to be actually mentally insane <laughs> to want to to want to actually go and attack him. Um, so, so anyway, have you ever had that uh, Guru Skelberg where? Yeah, si- similar, similar. It's a little bit of a stupid story, but uh, it wasn't only about presence, but the, not in the beginning at least. But uh, I was on a nightclub. This is many years ago. Uh, just up dancing, have some good time with a couple of friends. Um, had a nice lady to dance with. And uh, a stupid guy walks over the dance floor with a couple of beers in his hand, which is kind of stupid. It's not the right way to bring a couple of beers. 
So he he I bounce into him because I don't see him. So he got some beer on on his clothes. So he's trying to <clears throat> throw the beers at me. <clears throat> and uh, before it happens, I intercept and put that hand in the face I like to do. And I pushed him away really, really hard. So he fell with all those glasses and stuff, uh, made, made a mess. And he just got back up and he still had that broken glass in his hand. And uh, he was just about to rush me. And uh, I was ready. I just raised my hands, but I didn't do anything. I just raised my hands. And he probably started to read me as a person there because he just got up really mad, watched me, and then he put the glass down and turned around and walked. <laughs> just go lick your wounds. It's time to just go lick your wounds. <laughs> but, but I love he, it. He, here's the kicker to that. I think I might have lifted my leg. I raised my hand and lifted my leg. If it's running, I'm ready. But I, I didn't throw a punch. I didn't throw a kick or anything. But I, I was very ready because if he was going to glass me or stuff like that, I can't let him come close. But I was working at the airport again, like I talked about before. Day after, the rumor were that I had beaten down a guy at the nightclub. Hmm. And the only thing I did was pushing him. But everybody saw me because it was a lot of noise when he fell with all the glasses and stuff. But And then they saw me with a hand hands up and the leg a little bit in the air. So they thought I've been kicking or punching him. That's interesting. Love it. And the Love only it. thing I did was push him. But everybody said, yeah, he beat down a, a guy in a nightclub yesterday. Mm. So that again, the consequences. And the, if that wouldn't been going to court, I would have a lot of my friends witnessing the wrong way because that's ah. what they thought they saw. But then the other thing is nobody fucked with you at the airport anymore. All right. <laughs> That's true. I, I, always, I always got paid. Little, little cupcakes <laughs> in your locker in the morning. Building a reputation. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Keeps people away. <laughs> when I worked in a, uh, when I left university, I worked in a factory here in this uh, community. <clears throat> After a couple of months, somebody came out and challenged me and I didn't push him away. He, he was laying in the street when I drove away. Nobody in that factory, even for the next 10 years, ever bothered me ever, even once again. Like they never, nothing. Um, so that's, you know, how are we doing for time? We are out of time. So we should probably round this up and rock and roll. Yeah. So let's, uh, Sean, you want to lead us around the horn and with oh. final thoughts? And yeah. I mean, do you want me to start? Yeah. I'm happy to. You know, I love this conversation. I think it's the most important conversation. You know, Hanchi Legacy just really talked like this is a fighting art like this is I didn't get into this because like I already loved my ballet and my modern and I still do. But I left them because I also wanted to be able to move that way, but affect a martial change if needed. I did not know how to fight growing up. I did not have a role model for that. And the martial arts that wouldn't allow me to do this would have been a martial art. I'd have quit. Um and when we talk about this sort of rubber meets the road stuff, and if anybody's watching and feels like it's a bunch of guys telling war stories, 10% yes, 90%, if your martial art won't do this for you, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, there's no world in which you could describe to my 16 year old self that I will stand opposite a one percenter biker and feel absolutely calm while they threaten me. Uh, that came after training, that came after fighting a thousand guys tougher than him not overtly more aggressive but tougher and so i think this is a really important conversation and i uh, i'm always honored to be a part of it with, with my teachers and betters um but at the same time i i really i don't i don't think this conversation's had enough in the martial arts world i agree so you know what do you want to go out on what's your your final thought about this well, I love this conversation. Um, really, I got two simple takeaways. One is, I love what you said. You'd have to be freaking crazy to attack Girl Skullberg. I don't care who you are, man. If your eyes aren't open, you are an idiot. <laughs> and second of all, this is my new mantra. Push him away. Push him in the face. Push him away in the face really, really hard. <laughs> That's brilliant. I absolutely love that. Yeah, as long as you're pushing him away with a clenched fist, I agree with you. It's accelerating upon impact. <laughs> Since the legacy, where do you want to go with this conversation as we're wrapping it up here? Well, I sort of want to finish it um, back with your education. You know, that's why in my dojos, I never give 
a young lady, 13 years old, or a young guy, eight year old, a black belt, because in a way you're giving them self-confidence and they'll go out there and think they can do something and put themselves in danger. Uh, a quick story would be, say you're uh, anyone, a father is, has a 13 year old daughter and somebody breaks into his house at nighttime, is he gonna send his 13 year old daughter downstairs to face that person? Or is he gonna go himself? Like we can answer that, right? Nobody's gonna send the 13 year old daughter. But if the guy's like a mature black belt, he will be the one to go down and protect the house. That's just an example of, of getting a good type of education and preparing people face the worst love that sensei you know i agree uh johan scopa we're gonna give you the last word for sure um i want to just say a couple of things that i'm going to be thinking about i i always like one i i also want to say like i'm really proud that we have a good relationship with you now that we've met each other and we can talk about these things i really feel like it's kindred spirits like it's very similar thinking um yeah so um it's not your choice how far things will go you said that yeah. i really that really resonated with me it's not it's not your choice um the line of submission that you said like you need to push yourself to the line of submission where you submit or somebody else submits and figure out where that is right and that the fight starts when you have to fight but you want to stop. You, you want to stop, but you there's you don't have a choice. You got to keep fighting. And I really like those, those thoughts. Um, I also, I, I said it, I can't take the consequence of not acting. I think that's that's an awesome thing for martial arts to contemplate um, because we all have great power. And on the presence thing, I want to say, I was recently with you and Sense Suino and Sense Legacy and Sean, we were all in a room together and it was a very social atmosphere. Like there was no real threat, but there was a person who had maybe consumed a little bit too much alcohol and mm. tried to interrupt our conversation. And I just remember you held on to him and said, I'll talk to you in a minute. And he instantly just kind of petered away <laughs> and left us <the> alone <laughs> to finish our conversation. And uh, I'm going to hold that as a story with you that I, I'm always going to remember. So Anyway, what do you want to go out on, uh, Johan Skelberg, before? Uh, uh, I think, I think we said, uh, said, said most of it, and I totally agree. I'm very grateful for being part of the, this um, podcast here, and so great to have met you finally, and uh, we can stay and share, share ideas and thoughts. But uh, I just want to catch back, uh, make sure you get some, yourself some knockout power, uh, go for that submission thing, test yourself out to understand your own limits and uh, your own capabilities and uh, understand the importance of distance uh, awareness and uh, make sure you can do everything you have to do to get back mm. home awesome what an absolute pleasure yeah so ben's i'm just going to say to people who watch this after we've got a great podcast here we've got a new website we've got a new social network platform if you can help us by liking or sharing or subscribing or sending it out, that would be great. The other thing since the and I have really been talking about lately is on the website, punchkickchokechat.com. If you go on that, you can suggest people that you want us to have on the podcast to talk to, and you see, you can suggest some topics. So if you're watching this later and you're thinking, this was so cool, they should talk to this person, please mm -hmm. hit us up and hit us up and send that in and, Give us a path forward to keeping this dialogue going for the martial arts community. Love you, that. Yeah, you can go out, Sean. What do you want to say? Last thing. I just want to say, you know, um, I, I really don't want to add any thoughts to it, but I just love the idea of uh, training until someone quits as opposed to a timer. Um, I think that's incredible. And I think that's something that really, um, I think of how many times I grapple and I look at the clock and I go, great, if I can ride this out for 20 seconds, I win. <laughs> and that's not actually true when that timer goes away. So just thanks for that, Guru Skelberg. I, I, I really appreciate hearing your perspectives. And, and I just want to say thanks to everybody for listening and watching. And it's such a gift. And, you know, four of us on this call will be meeting again in a few hours because we do this because we love it and we love that you're here with us. So we'll see you tonight. 
even though it'll be asynchronous. And thanks, Senseis. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Girl Scrub Work. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Stay healthy. Happy holidays. Yeah. Happy holidays.